heard me talk about this dry subject already. <laughs> it is kind of dry, um, but I'll try to uh, I'll try to get through it without being too dry. Um, what I would like to start out with this this time around, I actually have and Sarah was wonderful to remind me about a PowerPoint presentation. That I have one that's up right now. Um, this is one I used for um, mainly home inspectors back in the day when I go speak at home inspector conferences uh, about asbestos. Um, there was some other stuff in there I've taken out. Um, it is pretty dry, but what I did do is throughout the PowerPoint, there's different photographs. And those photographs, I swapped out some other photographs that I had in there, and they kind of relate to what you guys will see in older homes in Toronto and surrounding areas. So the photos themselves that you'll see from the next page on will be stuff that uh, you guys will come and probably see quite often. So um, anyways, I'm going to get going. So uh, I know some of you guys uh, have met me before on this uh, before, but I'll give you my quick elevator spiel. Uh, Michael from CO2 Solutions. Uh, been in business for about 18 years and about 10 years of it doing asbestos last 10 years and that's become a large portion of uh, of my business is asbestos because there is a lot around and as you see in this presentation um, I have pointed out a lot of products and where asbestos has come from and a lot of products that it's in so it's uh, certainly something that's going to keep me in business for quite some time um, yeah so Sarah would you mind flipping to the first slide or second slide of the show please Absolutely. Thank you Working so much. On it. <laughs> okay, why is it not letting me? Okay, I think now we're good. Ah, perfect. That's awesome. So I say, I, I, some of the stuff you guys are already know, I've talked about before, and you've probably done your own research and know a lot about it, but uh, I will skip through some of this stuff because I said it is dry um, and it is kind of annoying, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about what asbestos is and where it comes from and uh, how it's been integrated into our society over the last 100 plus years. Um, so what is asbestos? It's a natural occurring mineral rock. Um, it's, it's mined, uh, in the ground. It's there, it's actually mined in mines. It, it can come up in the ground in two inches of soil. It just depends on the various minerals are in that. soil, whether or not it's produced or not. Um, it is, as you see, there's six types of, of, of asbestos that's in the world. Uh, chrysotile is the one that's first listed. And this is the one that we have we come in contact with most and it's it's um if you guys have ever seen uh reports i've i've done reports for a couple of you guys um over the last uh, little while where i've done vermiculite sampling or other sampling uh chrysotile is the one that comes up and they they use that in so many products as you'll see coming up um it's it the picture that's there that is basically under a microscope and that is that is a large chunk of asbestos uh, and I say that's under a microscope, that's something that they can, you could probably see that's, it, it, that actual piece is probably millimeters uh, uh, big. And that's, that's probably millions and millions of pieces of fibrous asbestos uh, particles in that little bunch that you see there. Um, yeah, Sarah, can you go to the slide three, please? So, um, this is kind of corny, but in a weird way, I put why is asbestos awesome, um, minus the health concerns. Asbestos, the reason why it's used so, so much around the world is all these properties that I show in the slide. Um, it's a fire resistant uh, mineral, it's a thermal insulator, it's chemical resistant, uh, electrical insulator, uh, it's bacteria resistant, it's super, super, super strong uh, and it's super lightweight. It's also absorbs sound and it's water resistant. Um, so you combine all those properties. Um, it's probably one of the most amazing minerals that's out there in, I guess you would say almost like in the uh, manufacturing construction industry, uh, because of all those properties, there's not very many, very many minerals out there that, that are, are like asbestos. And when they found out how amazing it is, they started to throw it into everything they could think of and it's been used for hundreds maybe even thousands of years they, they found it in uh ancient uh concrete like stones that they've, they've built ancient buildings so it's been used forever 
Um, next slide, please, sir. Uh, so this next slide just gives a, a quick overview of, of types of things. Um, oh, and that previous slide, just so you know, that was pipe wrap insulation. That is something I wanted to show you guys. Um, that's something that you guys will come in contact quite often, the older homes you'll see in Toronto. Um, so that's on that last slide. Uh, this slide, you'll see that's uh, linoleum uh, flooring. That's something, it's also another product that you guys will see come up quite a bit in homes. Um, so how's it been used over the years? Wow, uh, concrete, uh, siding, roofing, asphalt, spray fireproofing, um, uh, wallboard and joint compound. What they mean by that is uh, the joint compound in uh, uh, drywall, for example. So drywall pre-1990 basically uh, always has the potential to have asbestos in it, especially the drywall compound. Uh, acoustical plaster. So plaster homes in Toronto, anywhere from built in the late 1800s all the way up until probably the early 80s when they used plaster board, um, different types of plaster, it's in plaster. Uh, vinyl floor tiles, you guys know those dreaded nine by nine tiles? <laughs> They're in probably about 80% of those nine by nine tiles that were made pre-1988. Uh, linoleum elastic, uh, vinyl baseboard, carpet mastic, glues, uh, flooring glues. Um, I see, you'll see insulation on there. Uh, Non-construction materials, um, it's used, it was used heavily in automotive. They still use it to this day um, in brake pads. Um, they use it in, you know, that little rubber seals or kind of almost like rubber seals around your stove. Uh, it's put in those still. So we still manufacture it to this day and we still use it in household products around our house, believe it or not. Um, also, in, you'll see there's fire resistant, resistant materials, protective gloves, suits, racing suits. They, they've tended to get away from it now. Uh, there's regulations for race car racing suits. They don't use it much anymore. Uh, lamp wicks, uh, fire resistant cloth. There's literally... I, can, I could go on and on, but those are, those are the ones that we probably would see the most in our, in our society. Uh, but around the world, like I said, they still manufacture uh, a lot of products with asbestos in it. Uh, next slide, sir, please. Ah, this is the photo that I wanted to share with you guys last time uh, that I didn't get to you guys. Uh, this is a wonderful representation of of where it is, the potential to have asbestos in homes. This just breaks down where in your home there's potentially asbestos if it's anything kind of pre-1990. Um, and I won't go through all of them, uh, but I'm gonna point out some very common ones and I'll, I'll, I'll review them again. Uh, but very common ones that you guys will see uh, that when you walk into homes that you can pick out will be things like pipe insulation uh, which is on one of the pages that I, previous pages, which is, um, it's wrapped around heating pipes. Uh, also ductwork, uh, which you'll see the, a photo coming up. A lot of ductwork uh, for HVAC, um, you'll find it wrapped around the ductwork as an insulator. Um, also, they put it around, uh, which we find a lot of is heat registers. There's a one inch strip that gets wrapped around heat registers. Uh, that's so common, and I'll talk about that in a little while, actually, because it's something I want to I want to talk to you guys about. Um, loose fill insulation is, is another one as well, which you guys have probably heard me talk about before. Last time was vermiculite and zonalite in attics. That's very very common. Uh, textured ceilings, you know, the the wonderful beautiful popcorn ceilings. That's one uh, kind of the the '60s, '70s, and '80s. Also textured ceilings from the probably the 30s up to the 60s where you'll see nice beautiful actually i have in my house if i could show you i have some in my house i have textured ceiling in my living room still that has asbestos in it uh but i haven't taken it down because it's beautiful and i keep it up because i love it uh but you'll be walking in these old homes where they have these beautiful designs in the ceilings and it looks like just like plaster 
Uh, a lot of that, if it's pre-1970, it's very likely to have asbestos in that. Um, and you'll notice a lot of times it can be in poor condition as the house gets older, it shifts, uh, the house settles, it cracks. Um, you see that quite often. Um, the other thing is uh, tiles. There's two versions of tiles, I think I talked about earlier. It was vinyl tiles, you see in that picture, it was nine by nines. Linoleum as well. And the backing of both tiles and linoleum has this mastic or glue, and that is heavy, heavy asbestos content in those. Um, also, acoustic tiles you'll see in a lot of basins and drop ceilings. Uh, that comes up a lot as well. That's, those typically aren't asbestos. It's like a 20% chance that those may contain asbestos in it, but it is something that typically we do test a lot. Um, I think that's pretty much it for, for houses that we come across. I think that you guys should be aware of, um, like I said, the insulations, the, the pipe wrap and tiles, um, are stuff that you guys would see. Um, yeah, uh, there are some exterior stuff in houses, caulkings, window caulkings. A lot of Ontario window caulkings have asbestos. It was a one company. Uh, there's actually a couple of companies that were in Ontario, John Mansville, uh, they're a siding company, but they also make caulkings and glues. Um, they, uh, there's a lot of homes in Ontario that have asbestos caulking on windows. So it's not much of a, uh, an issue because it's an outdoor product. So uh, it was only used outdoors. So if it's outdoors, it's not considered dangerous. Uh, but it is, it is something to be aware of. And uh, yeah, next slide, please, sir. Uh, this next slide just kind of talks about why it's bad. I think I have a couple slides. I'll just kind of glance over them a little bit. Um, I've talked about before, but the, the fibers of asbestos are so tiny you can't see with the human eye. I think they're 0 0.002 microns. So one asbestos fiber is it, it, impossible to detect. Uh, impossible. Uh, I put on here, I get questions all the time about, you know, if I put on a mask, am I safe? in my basement if I, you know, if I'm removing, I get questions about asking removing, removing tiles, for example, vinyl tiles, for example, and I'll, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, you know, can I wear a dust mask? Definitely not. Um, Non-approved uh, mask for asbestos, <laughs> you can't use dust masks, anything, uh, even the stuff at Home Depot. Home Depot does sell one mask, it's called a P100 filtered mask. Those are the filters you have to use when you're around asbestos. Um, also, I get asked a lot about vacuums because um, some people do do small abatements themselves. Like, you know, I do encourage it if it's something that is a, a non-friable material, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, they ask me about vacuuming up as well, and can I use my Dyson to vacuum up the dust? Like, no. <laughs> um, although I, I love my Dyson vacuums, I have two. Uh, they're not rated for uh, asbestos. They're not rated for that level of HEPA vacuums, even though they consider themselves 99.97% uh, HEPA filtered, um, it's still not good enough uh, for asbestos uh, vacuuming. So uh, it has to be wetted and swept up. Um, the fibers are noted on there, they're so tiny and light that they stay airborne for a long time. And I put that in there because um, I get a question a lot about vermiculite insulation and zonolite insulation in attics. Um, a lot of people do have it in their attics that does contain asbestos and they ask me uh, if we don't touch it, if we don't go into the attic, uh, we're fine. Uh, are, are we fine? And I say yes. But um, on the flip side of that, you never want to go into your attic if you have vermiculite or zonolite in it because the asbestos fibers aren't actually in the vermiculite and zonolite, they just kind of lay on top. And any kind of backdraft, like your attic is an open space to outside with soffits and vents. So there is a, a natural airflow in your attic that creates air. So when you open your attic hatch, it creates a backflow. That backflow will pick up anything dust-wise from your attic and draw it into your house. Asbestos is so light and tiny, it just continually stays airborne. And in an attic where there's vermiculite and sunlight, it just stays floating around. So when you open your attic hatch, it pulls that dust and that dust that potentially contains asbestos comes into your house. So uh, 
I like to note that it is so tiny and small and light that it gets airborne so easily no matter what situation. Uh, it is easily inhaled. And the last note is, and it kind of, I kind of get in more detail in the following uh, slides, is that it's so strong the body can't break it up. So once it gets into your lungs and stomach, it's, it, can, it connects to uh, the alveoli in your lungs. It connects to the, um, I forget what they're called in your stomach, uh, the little nodules in your stomach connects to them and it gets caught. Uh, the reason why it's bad and uh, basically when it gets caught in your lungs, for example, your body has this innate reaction and it wants to remove anything that gets in your lungs. So your body attacks those fibers uh, that get stuck in your lungs in large quantities. Well, it, it's impossible. Your, your, your blood, your, your body cannot remove that. And then it, that's when it farts, starts forming um, uh, scar tissue that becomes cancerous in your lungs. There's different forms of it, but that's generally how it is. Your body just cannot remove it like it can do normal things. Um, so it gets stuck. The other thing is um, stomach. And this I've put this in more recently. And actually, Sarah, can you go to the next slide for me? Thank you. Um, I've added this, uh, the stomach side, and this is something that's just come up in the last probably two, three years. Um, and I like to talk about because it used to be thought, the, the general thought was, you know, for the last 30 years when this became an issue was that if it was only if you breathed it in, only if you inhaled it, um, it would be bad for you. That's not the case anymore. So studies have shown that if you ingest it as well, they're finding that the asbestos is the same in your stomach that it does to your lungs, that it gets caught and it, your body cannot remove it. And the reason I'm saying that is um, there's, a, 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 maybe I'll send Sarah this, this there's, a, there's actually a new, uh, a new documentary, uh, actually W5 did it. It's a Canadian uh, version of it as well. W5 did, and it's basically they, what they found is that there's something called transit piping and it's used for water mains. So thankfully, uh, Toronto is probably one of the least uh, places in the world that they use transit piping uh, for water mains. They use it for some sewage, uh, but not for water transfer to our homes. But they're all around North America, they use this transit piping, which is basically asbestos based uh, for for, for water delivery to your homes. So Detroit, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, I, think, I think Winnipeg is one of them. They can actually see on one of the government websites is that you can see where the transit piping still exists and where it's delivering water to and where they still have to remove it from. Uh, the Canadian government has been removing it for the last 10 years throughout Canada. Uh, and as I said, there's not much in Toronto. There's very little left. Um, I think there's, it, Canada's pretty good. We've been pretty diligent in removing it all. Um, but I just wanted to note that, that that's something that it is something you can ingest as well and, uh, and can be a problem. Um, as I said, uh, why is bad? Just a little breakdown of why is bad. Um, yeah. And, oh, that picture on that slide is uh, a picture of vermiculite. So if you see that in a house attic, or if a home inspector points it out to you, uh, most are aware of what it is now, most home inspectors, but that is what vermiculite insulation looks like, and, and zonolite is very similar to that, and that is what is in attics. It uh, kind of looks like a, a mica rock and can be shiny as well. Um, uh, next slide, please, sir. Thank you. Um, I won't really talk about what's on the, with the health info, but I wanted to show you guys that picture. That is John Mansville Siding, uh, the company that was in uh, Durham region for many, many years. Actually, I think it's still there. They still make different types of insulation uh, and sidings. But this is a siding of an exterior house, and it's, um, it's a, uh, a non-friable product. It's, just called, it's almost like a cement board, but you'll see that a lot. Uh, maybe not so much in Toronto anymore, uh, but you'll see it a lot in the Durham region and into uh, Peterborough Corthas and into um, basically east as well. I think Ottawa as well. Um, next slide, please, sir. Okay, this is something I wanted to talk about. So uh, one of the questions I get is what are the difference between um, 
different types of asbestos. Um, in our world, we classify uh, uh, asbestos friable and non-friable asbestos. And I apologize if I've gone through this before, but I thought with the photographs and some other information, I could, I could share some more information about it. Um, friable versus non-friable material. Um, a friable, basically how we classify it, a friable material is something that you can, like that pipe wrap or that picture that's, that's off to the right there is actually a duck wrap. So that's something that you can take in your hand or very easily crush and you can actually see dust come from it or it's very, very soft. Um, and when that happens, uh, even, for example, where you see that picture where it's cracked and that piece is falling off. Well, if you were to touch that with your hand and just run your finger along one of those cracks, you would release thousands and thousands of asbestos fibers from that. So um, that is considered a friable material. Uh, vermiculite is considered a friable, it's on light and friable. Pipe wrap, um, this ductwork as well. Um, acoustic sealing, uh, tiles as well, because they're a fibrous material you can break easily. Um, I think that's it pretty much that we would encounter friable. Non-friable is a material that's extremely hard uh, and you can probably still break it, but it's not something you're going to break easily. So a good example of that is those wonderful 9x9 tiles that we see all the time that people talk about. So those, those 9x9 vinyl tiles, uh, you can break them but they do take effort to break. It's not like you're going to take in your hand and be able to crush it your hand and turn to dust. Um, you still have to be cautious around them and, and remove them properly and take, you know, take certain precautions while dealing with them, but they're not so much uh, an issue um, because they're, they're a hard material. That transit siding I showed you in the last picture, uh, that is a non-friable material as well. It's, it's almost like a cement board and it's very difficult to, uh, to break into many, many pieces. Um, I think what else would be friable? I think that's it. If something comes to mind, I'll let you guys know. But uh, yeah, uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, this is just general from information about asbestos. So, you know, I get asked that question all the time. You know, if the, I have... You know, I get a lot, even friends, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll call me and say, yeah, I just bought a house and, you know, it's a century home and we have some, um, you know, uh, pipe wrap in the basement, you know, old boiler system. Uh, is it safe, you know, that we, that we, we, we keep it or should we remove it? And my thing is, is yes, I mean, it's, it's safe as long as it's in good condition. Stuff like there's certain things in, if it's in good condition, it's, it's safe. Uh, pipe wrap uh, can be safe. More pipe wrap I see, um, because it is old, it gets deteriorated, you'll see cracks, you'll see breaks. Um, it is something that we can repair. Uh, we do do repairs on that stuff as well, if it's only, uh, I always say remove it, it's best to have it gone, but uh, I understand it's, it's a huge cost to have it removed sometimes. So we do do repairs on it quite often. Um, but things like vermiculite insulation, I'm really on the fence about you know, insulation in attics, you know, whether it should be removed or not. Um, I, I always, I, I like to lean towards the, um, you know, the, the removal of it in your attic because um, we've seen situations like the last windstorm two years ago, we saw about 60 houses with trees drop on them and it broke through their house and it broke through into their, into their house, the vermiculite directly into the house and spread asbestos throughout. So, um, things like that where you think it's in your attic and it's fine and it's safe, but uh, there is potential for it to enter your house in other ways. Um, I put in here, if, if, you, if, you, if you have it, if you find damaged ACM, it, it, damaged ACM uh, I say ACM, uh, asbestos containing material, um, you know, your best to you know, contact a company to have it assessed. You know, a good guy, a good company is going to, going to point you in the right direction and say, yeah, no, it's fine. You can leave it. It's not going to bother you. Uh, these are your options. If you want to remove it, this is what it would cost. But, you know, it's in, in good condition. Let it stay. Um, you know, I, I, I work with a ton of contractors, ton, ton, ton of contractors, and I got calls every day. 
you know, we op opened up a wall or we, or we did that or we safe and I get pictures every day and text all the time. So, um, you know, a lot of times I I'll tell them to wait, let me assess, go and assess. Um, you might do renovations in your own home and open it up a wall and you'll see ductwork that's wrapped. Uh, might be in good condition, uh, might not be, but I always say just just let's let her, let someone professional assess it for you. Um, it is it is difficult because I know it is a huge cost for abatements, but uh, uh, for myself personally, uh, you know, myself and my other estimator, we we try to just we try to offer advice, you know, and and be honest about it, you know, as far as if it does need to be removed or not. I'm not gonna I don't remove everything. I sometimes repair we repair stuff so. Some things can stay. So be aware, don't always be told, you know, that it always has to remove because it can stay sometimes. Uh, the picture that's showing up on that page is an amazing rep representation of older style ductwork, the round ductwork in an older home. And it's going up to, you'll see it go up to that L shape and it goes up to a boot. Um, now you have, you'll have the rectangular ductwork very similar and you'll have the, the round ductwork like this in older homes. Um, this is typically in century homes, the, the round ductwork, and then you'll see the, the rectangular ductwork is typically in homes uh, six, uh, maybe 50s to 80s. Um, the reason I wanna show you, show you guys this one, where it goes up to that boot up top, you'll see it's the white asbestos wrap around that boot. Um, I, we get a lot of calls about these heat registers and should we remove them, you know, is this dangerous? And, this is one that I say, yes, I always say, yes, let's remove it because that asbestos wrap uh, at the top where it meets the floor, you generally goes about a quarter of an inch above the tin work. Well, that airflow, that wonderful hot air that runs through your, or cool air, whatever it is that runs through your ductwork meets that asbestos at the top of that, that register. And it continually dries it out and you have air flowing over top of it. So it's blowing it into homes. So it continually blows asbestos into, into, into houses. So when we find this, I always say, yes, uh, I, you have to have it removed. Just, just get it removed. Um, we, do, we do probably one or two of these a week, um, these with, with the heat duct registers. So that is one to keep an eye on. And an easy thing to do is if you're in a house that's pre-1980 is you can pop, even if you're curious for yourself or your own place, just pop the heat register off your floor, get a flashlight and you can shine down beside the tin. If you see, if you see a little bit of white around the tin, that's asbestos. Um, next slide, Sarah, please. Oh, that's it. So yeah. Uh, Questions. I know. I know you guys may have questions um, or experiences. Um, if this isn't the best spot to 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 uh, to, to voice them, um, you can always send me an email or call me or or, or text me. Uh, but yeah, if you guys have any questions or or uh, concerns, let me know. I'm trying to unmute and it's just not working. <laughs> so um, we do actually have one question from Jake in the chat. Um, yeah. How do you repair the pipe wrap if it's in bad condition? Yeah, I mean, it depends on how, how bad a condition is. So uh, if there's little cracks and breaks and tears in it, uh, yeah, we, we repair it. So there's something we call, it's called canvas and lagging. So it's very similar to the old style way of, of how they actually created the pipe. But basically we have a fire resistant, uh, uh, basically almost like a fiberglass wrap that we cut into pieces and that we just wrap that around the, the old pipe. And then we have what's called an asbestos lagging. It's like a fire coating, almost like, uh, almost like a light plaster, more watery plaster. And basically we, we spread that over top of the broken and cracked areas and even it out. And then it eventually hardens and becomes that, that, that insulator. And also basically it hardens as well and becomes just a protective coating. So we can repair it. Um, sometimes I'm, if I'm being completely honest, sometimes the repairs cost just as much as the abatement themselves. So 
Um, I'm always learning towards abatement, but if it's only a couple small cracks and the, the 90 other 90% of the other stuff is in good condition, then yeah, a repair is, is certainly in order. You know, like a, a $500 repair as opposed to, you know, a, a $5,000 abatement is sometimes, you know, an option. So it can be repaired and, 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 uh, and done for sure. Yeah, and, and and that's one thing that I try to tell people. Don't don't let I would tell you that it always has to be removed. It doesn't always have to be removed. It can, there's there's situations that it can stay, and it can be repaired as well. And we do a lot of commercial. There's situations where there's convert commercial industrial scenarios where it just can't be removed. So we do some, and we just repair it. Um, a quick question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Alex. I don't know who was first. I was first. Okay, go ahead, Anna. Uh, um, Michael, speaking about inspection, let's say the inspector found or suspect that there is asbestos, right? Yeah. How days? How many days or how many? Like, how much will we ask to extend the inspection? Like, how long will it take to get the results? That's, and when that's it, where where is it sent? Yeah. So that's good. That's a good question. So um, one thing that comes up all the time, I, I calls and questions all the time, is is <clears throat> I, I get pictures and texts all the time. Is this asbestos? So, um, you know, a good portion of time I can tell by the naked eye that there's certain, certain things like pipe wrap and, and, and duct work and stuff like that. Duct wrap. I can tell right away that's going to be asbestos. But if it needs to be tested, because uh, not all floor tiles have asbestos, not all linoleum flooring has asbestos, not all vermiculite and zonite has asbestos on it. So if I go in, so if, if myself or one of my guys goes in to do the test, we come in on a Monday morning and we, we grab the samples, we send them to our lab in Toronto. Um, and if it's a bulk sampling of product, say we're testing uh, like a tile, vinyl tile, uh, from the time I take it on a Monday, we should know by Wednesday at four o'clock. So it's typically 48 hours, two business days is, is the general rule of thumb before we know it's asbestos or not, we get the lab results. So figure two days. We can um, expedite that uh, 24 hours. So I can make it one day. Um, I don't like to do that because it doesn't always work out that way because it, it's kind of based on the lab. The lab sometimes just gets an overflow. Like right now, the labs, all the labs in Ontario are, they're just overwhelmed because of the flooding. All the flooding that's happened, there's been so many materials being tested, sent to labs being tested right now that their labs are backed up. There's still, my lab's still meeting their deadline of two days, which is great. Uh, some aren't. So, but yeah, uh, sometimes we can have 24 hours. And the other thing with the 24 hour, there's additional cost to it. I think it's an additional $200 per sample or $150 per sample. And they don't guarantee that it's going to be 24 hours. So, but 48 so, hours is a general rule of thumb. Even with the backup, with whatever labs have backup, is still 48 hours would be okay or you should ask for three business days? Um, you know what? I'm always telling everyone two business days from when I pick it up. And I, I haven't... I think only once the lab has let me down and they were just, they just had an influx of, of things going on, or maybe there was a sickness. I don't know. They just called me, let me know they were a day behind, but it's only happened to us once where it's been an additional day and it didn't matter in that situation anyways. Uh, but I, I think you're generally, you're, you're two days, two business days. I think you're safe to say that. Alex, go ahead. Uh, yeah. I actually just had another question come to mind since Anna's. Um, <laughs> this is more maybe for the team as well. Uh, there was a time in commercial where um, a tenant would find, you know, go to be doing their leasehold improvements and they'd find um, asbestos. And there's a lot of legal actions that kind yeah. of went back and forth because the land would be like, that's not my job. And tenant would be like, well, this is your building. I didn't know when it's such a huge cost. And so if you were representing the tenant, you would have to start putting in um, language that protects them and then vice versa if you're landlord yes. and I've been on both sides of it. So yeah. for the team, say inspector finds it, we go to Michael, two days later, we find there's asbestos between a seller and a buyer who like, are we then negotiating on behalf of the buyer to say, okay, we're, the price is coming down. Like, how is that? What are you guys seeing when it comes to residential? 
if if on my side i can tell you i can tell the general rule of thumb that 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 we've dealt with for the last whether it be mold asbestos and real estate deals generally it's the it's the um the seller that has dealt with it um you know and obviously you you guys probably know it's more like the negotiating side (laughs) it's uh I understand it can be very difficult for you guys to negotiate that. But generally, from, from what I see, it's generally the seller that deals with it on their side. Now, I do see sometimes there's concessions where they do, where we put an estimate in, they just take off the price of the, the home and, and so on and so forth. But generally, we're most deals that I deal with, we're usually going in and removing it, the asbestos side. Maybe not the mold side, but, but maybe the asbestos side, we're going in to remove it. on, And the, typically, it's a seller. Mm-hmm. Backing up a little more, uh, when you're talking about the commercial industrial side and that sort of thing, landlord versus tenant. So there is a law, it's written law. So the Ministry of Labor that has, and I'll, I've, I've referred to this in the last time, it's called Ministry Ontario Regulation 27805, has been written based on asbestos. So in those laws, those written laws, it's the landlord. They have to be aware. So they're responsible. So it's definitely a landlord. They're responsible for everything in their home or property. So they have to know, and actually I'm going to talk about this. This is so, this actually kind of opens a whole can of worms that I actually like to talk about. So a landlord um, and also a, uh, a homeowner is responsible for everything in their home, knowing what's in their home. And this kind of goes towards even us as homeowners. So I ran into this the other day. So this is a, a wonderful example. Uh, big, beautiful home in Toronto. Uh, big renovations going on. Uh, you know, I think it's probably a, a $5 million home. Beautiful house. The house has been demoed. Uh, they did find some ductwork in the attic, some HVAC ductwork that had an asbestos wrap around it. So we were brought in to evaluate that and remove it. I walked in the house and the demo crew was still there. And this demo crew... So they actually had the whole house demoed already. It's plaster house, plaster house, demoed complete from bottom to top. No masks, no nothing. Um, and, you know, there are foreign workers, and I see this all the time. Uh, there was four guys, no masks, no suits, no nothing. And the ductwork was a big thing. It, it, you know, it was out of the way, and that was fine. I wasn't concerned about the ductwork. The ductwork wasn't my concern. The concern with that was is that plaster um ceiling tiles all the stuff the materials they took out of the house all had a potential to have asbestos in it um i just be happened to meet the homeowner at the same time and i told him i said you have to bring those demo guys out of your house right now and what we have to do is test the leftover products in the house that are there because they potentially have asbestos in them and they could be spreading asbestos throughout that house and, and working in it lo and behold i tested drywall plaster um, textured ceilings. They had a lot. There's still actually two walls in the house that had texture on it, like a plaster texture. I tested those. Everything came back asbestos. So the law now states, OSHA now states, that, and, and the Ministry of Labor now states that a homeowner or landlord has to know everything that's in their home. So if you're going to do a renovation, you have to know what's in that plaster. So you have to have it tested. There's something called, um, oh my gosh, the name of the, I'm drawing a complete blank of the form, uh, a DSS. It's a Designated Substance Survey. And I, I'll send this guys to, I'll send, what is, I'll send this to an email so you guys are aware of this. Designated Substance Service, DSS report. It used to be only something that a commercial or an industrial property owner had to do. And basically what that is, is an industrial hygienist uh, comes into a house or property, or back then it was just an industrial property, a commercial property, and they take samples of everything that's going to be touched in that place. Everything. Every material. If they're going to knock out a wall, a ceiling, touch pipes, floors, everything. They have to test all those materials for asbestos, uh, VOCs, uh, lead, paint, everything. So everything gets tested. It's literally probably... Uh, depending on what they're taking out, it could be, could be 50 different types of materials. So how that relates to this is that homeowners now are now responsible. 
So now the Ministry of Labor doesn't have enough enforcement officers to regulate this right now, but it will happen soon. And so now they're going around to demos or constructions where they see a building permit. We're stopping in and asking for DSS reports on residential properties. And the case I dealt with the other day that I'm still dealing with is that this homeowner, he is liable for everyone in his house. So whether it's a contractor or those, those demo guys. So right now, I'm going to say this, excuse me, like he's shitting his pants because he is liable for the health of those guys that he brought into his house to do those demos. So if they follow through and if they go get x-rayed and get their chest x-rayed and they find that there's asbestos in lung, not that they probably won't because the demo guys, there's still a little bit of responsibility on the, con con the contractor as well. And I'll get to that in a minute. But technically by law, that homeowner or property owner is responsible for everyone that goes into his house to make sure that they are safe, that whatever materials in the house, whatever we're dealing with is that they are safe. Your response, they're, they're like your kids. You have to look at them as your kids. You have to make sure that they are safe. Now, whether or not those guys, contractors in your house, whether or not they actually follow through and put their masks on and, and do their due diligence and all that stuff, as long as the, the homeowner has relayed that these are the materials in the house that you have to deal with uh, and they see it and they pass that information along, um, that transfers a liability onto the contractor. So, it, you know, they can deal, the contractor can now deal it as how they say fit. But from the beginning, it goes homeowner, landlord, uh, property owner, down to contractor. So it can be, it can be transferred. Um, it can be really, and I, I try to talk about this quite a bit now because um, let's face it, there's a lot of people that do home renovations. There's a lot of people that just don't, I, I meet a lot of contractors don't care uh, and it's, it's actually pretty scary. And this one situation I'm dealing with right now is actually really scary because the entire house is just asbestos dust. And we have to go in and, and basically create uh, negative air and, and basically clean the house. Think of it cleaning like the best cleaning you can do in a demoed house, like cleaning every speck of dust up out of a demoed house. It's almost impossible, but we have to manage that somehow now in this situation. And it's a uh, very, very, very where it would have been not very costly to remove the asbestos that was there. Now it's going to be incredibly costly for them to remove, to pay for the, the abatement. So, yeah, no, that's excuse, a great. Michael, question. Michael, yeah. excuse, excuse yeah. me, please. So from what year we would like, based on what year the house was built, we would feel comfortable and knowing that there, mo there are no asbestos. I always, yeah, I get the question. Often. Like so when was, when was this law? Yeah, well, when did this, the, Oh, um, yeah, uh, you know, the uh, Canadian government has said basically 1988 and backwards. Um, I've heard rumors of different types of drywall that's been imported from, from China that's a little bit later than that into the, you know, into 1990 uh, that had it. So there's always a chance, maybe, I, I just say 1990, honestly, I just say 1990. Um, now, like I said earlier in the presentation, um, asbestos is still used, and I still and I, I understand why because how great it is. Um, but we still uh, we still have a couple mines that we still mine it and export it, you know, to other countries, and it's used in third world countries for building and different practices. So um, if it makes it way back here or not, I don't know. Uh, but general thumb for myself is I say 1990 and backwards. Canadian government says 1988, I say 1990, so. Thank you. You're welcome. Amazing. Any other questions before we release you all back into the wild? <laughs> yeah, put it in the chat, in the chat. How much would that testing cost? You spoke about the testing, everything like 50. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So testing, so um, $285 uh, for bulk sampling. So that's vermiculite, or if you need to test plaster, that's three samples. So I include three samples in that. Uh, so I could, if, if you have one sample, I, I still have to charge you because the lab fees is still 285. If it's any more than three samples that we need to be tested, I think it's additional $75 per sample after the three samples. Yeah, and as far as questions go, guys, um, 
I know my number is, is, is going to be available to you guys. Once again, you can call, text, email, or, or, or whatever if you have more questions. I, there's always a couple extra questions so uh, in different scenarios. So um, I mean, no, my, I, my question was about those, if you need 50 tests, so it would cost <laughs> you thousands, right? It would cost a lot. Yeah. You know, because I'm a small business, I, you know, if it's, a, if you work on a commercial property that, that needs a lot of testing, or an industrial property, just let me know. We, yeah, we'll, we'll have a different price for that. That's, yeah, there'll, there'll certainly be a limit for us on how much it's going to cost. Like, we'll, we'll definitely work with you guys for sure. Yeah. Amazing. So good, Michael. This was incredible. We're so okay. grateful for your knowledge and expertise and gifting us your time this morning. We know you're so busy with the flooding. <laughs> and so we're even more grateful that you were uh, willing to spend some time with us this morning. I, this was so great. I really appreciate it. No, I, I appreciate it. You know, it's weird. Uh, I was telling one of my guys this morning, I said, I'm doing this again. I used to do this all the time. And, but it was never on Zoom. I, I'd go to you know, the meetings and be face to face and sit and stand in front. And I used to love doing it and standing in front. And so it's a little odd doing it Zoom, you know, you know, but uh, but I, I, I do really enjoy it. it's weird talking about asbestos because it's become my life. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, unfortunately or fortunately, it's become my life. So I do like talking about it. So, yeah. But anytime. Yeah. Just just let me know. Uh, refresh. Amazing. Your, uh, let me know or um, new people come on. Just let me know. And, and, and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions or concerns or want to ask me a, a question at all. Okay. Yeah, we'll definitely be sharing your information, your contact information with everybody okay. and a replay um, of the Zoom call this morning. So that way you can kind of refer back to some of the things that Michael touched on. And yeah, and then if you need to reach out to him, you will have his contact de details. All right, everyone. Well, have an incredible day. Make amazing things happen today. Michael, thank you so much. You're welcome. You're and we'll welcome. see you guys next time. Thanks, guys. Have Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.